Very good. Ananta Kalyana Gunaehi. These three very important words are quoted by Ramanuja and other great acharyas throughout the history of Vedic philosophy. Ananta, Ananta means that which is infinite, infinite, an infinite number. Kalyana means auspicious, that which is auspicious, that which is ultimately a good, a boon to have in one's life. And then Gunaihi is the plural of Guna, meaning attributes, qualities, modes, etc. So, Ananta, Kalyana, Gunaihi. This is one of the definitions of God, that God is that being who possesses an infinite number of auspicious attributes. And this is how we know what is God. Infinite Ananta, in two senses. First of all, infinite in the sense of there being quite literally no enumeration possible to try to calculate the precise number of auspicious attributes that God has. So, for example, in the English language, or for that matter, we can take any language, all languages together, combined, not just on this earth plane, but every single planet, including the planets of the gods, where their language is infinitely greater than ours. We can take every positive adjective, every positive word to describe a good attribute and combine them all. And we would not come close to beginning to understand how many auspicious attributes God has. That's the first sense in which we mean auspicious. The second sense is this, that each one of these attributes is expressed in God to an infinite degree. So you've heard me say this before, and until we hear this, we don't really think about this, but then when we hear it, we understand how silly a concept we had when it came to understanding the attributes of God. God is beautiful. All right, that is an attribute of God. But what does that mean? As I've said in the past, God would win a beauty contest? Would God come in second place? See, that's beauty. If you go in second place, that's pretty good. To what degree do we mean God is beautiful? Add a number, add a multiplier, make that number any number you can conceive of. God is more beautiful. But more, not just quantitatively is this the case, but qualitatively and source-wise this is the case. Because God is not just beautiful to an infinite degree. God is the source of all beauty. Thus, ontologically, beauty itself is ontologically dependent upon God. Think about this. It's not merely that God is beautiful to an infinite degree, which is true, but infinite beauty itself is dependent upon this being who we wish to know. Imagine this. And then again, imagine any attribute, knowledge, goodness, strength, any positive attribute. It's not merely that God has that attribute to literally an infinite degree, a degree greater than which is beyond even our comprehension. But God is actually the very foundation of that and the source of that. God is not just the strongest. God is strength, etc., etc. So this is why when we understand this definition of God that Ramanuja and others give us, Anantal Kalyana Gunaihi, that God is the source of an infinite number of auspicious attributes, then we begin to have a glimpse, and not just conceptually, but experientially, a glimpse of what it means to want to know this Absolute. So this is why when I tell people that, yes, what do you want to know in this world? You want to earn an MD? Become a brain surgeon? Ooh, that, that takes a lot of work. I've known a lot of people, I have disciples who are MDs. It takes a lot of work. Be prepared to memorize hundreds of items per week, week after week after week, and go, after, and go through test after test after test. And that's nothing. You're just learning how to fix a body. And even then, very imperfectly, you're going to lose some patience. You want to study, what? Not to, not to pick on uh, Dharmaraja, but physics. You want to study biology. You want to study, pick anything. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. Go ahead, get a PhD. 
It's not easy. And that's nothing in comparison to now making this statement. Not just, oh, I want to know medicine. I want to know music. I want to know this, that, the other. I want to know that which is the source origin of all the above. So this being the case, this is why earlier I was saying the finite attempting to know the infinite, it's not possible. Even one person going through medical school cannot become a specialist in every single field. They have to choose a field. And even with that, you have to kill yourself to complete it. Imagine if you wanted to complete every single field in medical school. Be a psychiatrist, you know, be just all the various fields of medicine that exist. Dozens of them, really. Not possible. And yet, we want to know that which is the origin of all health. The origin, again, of everything. Of our own mind that has the ability to know. It is an impossibility for the finite to know the infinite. Knowing this is the beginning of spiritual life. Why? Because it gives us humility. And when we have that humility, now we're open. The opposite of humility, egotism. Oh, I know everything. Oh, That's a wall made of the thickest brick around our head. And we're trapped in there with ourselves. That's make, that makes it even worse. We're trapped inside that wall with ourselves. And that can be the greatest torture. That's egotism. But when we have that humility to understand what is it that I wish to do? What is this task that is here before me? To know that being who is existent in every single atom of existence and upholds every atom that gives reality its glue. And even then, even all, even all that, that's just the functional nature of God. It's not even the important aspect of God. That God is the glue of reality, that's secondary. That's not who God is as a person. When we have that humility of understanding, wow, this is a big task before me, then that wall starts to, dis to disintegrate. And now we can see. Finally, now we can begin to see. Thus, this is the nature of God. God is a being who has auspicious attributes to an infinite number and each to an infinite degree. Now, that being said, we're going to look at these four verses from Srimad Bhagavatam. And these cover a minuscule number, a tiny number, but an important number of attributes of God. And before I read this, let me just tell people, these very specifically are attributes, and we'll see this when we read toward the end of, the, of these verses. These are attributes that are attributes of God, and specifically of Krishna, because that's who's being spoken of here, the avatar Krishna. But more, and this is very important, these are attributes that we are also meant to cultivate, that we have the ability to cultivate in ourselves. And again, we'll see this that this is actually said here toward the end of this. But first, let me read this very long verse, these four verses, I should say. We are not going to complete this today. We're going to complete this over maybe two or three classes, because it's so long. And each one of these we can talk about for a month. But let me just read this first. So, beginning, and I translated this over the course of the last two days or so. Took a little bit of time. And I enumerated these, which makes it a little bit easier. So, truthfulness, cleanliness, compassion toward others, patience, renunciation, contentment, santosha, contentment, honest straightforwardness, equipoise of the senses, austerity, indiscrimination of dualities, Stoic forbearance, cessation of materially motivated action, practice of scriptural truths, shruti, knowledge in the form of wisdom, freedom from illusory passion, aishwarya, sovereignty, sovereignty, heroism, splendor, 
strength, memory, self-reliance, skillfulness, radiant loveliness, firm gravity, gravitas, firm gravity, kindness, as well as self-confidence, modesty, moral integrity, mental determination, vigorous appearance, stamina, excellence, earnestness, steadfastness, faithfulness, illustriousness, being worthy of respect, freedom from false ego. All of these, as well as many other virtues that are desired by those who are worthy of greatness, are the eternal great attributes of the Supreme Godhead, Bhagavan. And these attributes never decline in him at any time. So very nice. Again, very, very long list. And I was extremely careful in translating this to make sure that the English words matched perfectly what was actually being conveyed in the Sanskrit. Uh, that's not always the case with translators. But in this case, these are as close in English as I could get to the actual Sanskrit. So, several things to be said about, about all this. Again, this is a partial list of virtues, of attributes. If we want to know the full list, we would have to go through the scriptures, and there are other lists, some of which replicate some of the things said here, some of which have many, many, many more attributes, virtues, etc. Altogether, there are thousands and thousands of various attributes of God that are described all throughout the totality of scriptures. And again, even that would be limited. Even that doesn't describe everything. So, several things. First of all, it's explained here that these are indeed the eternal great attributes of God. That these are attributes that God himself possesses. And several things. They never decline in him at any time. In other words, as human beings, human beings can possess good attributes. But there is the possibility that A, they can decline, and B, that they are not there perpetually. In other words, they came about at a certain time, and they could go away at a certain time. You could have a person who has, for example, let's say they develop extremely good health and stamina in their life, but in time that goes away, etc. What's being explained here at the very tail end, it's almost as if the way we're going to deal with this is backwards almost. What is being said here is that with God, on the other hand, these attributes never decline. In other words, he always has these attributes, and not only does he have them, what is meant by decline? By decline, there's the inference that there's a starting point. What is that starting point? That starting point is infinity. They never decline from infinity. And they are always with God. It's not that, oh, at one time, you know, let's just pick... Uh, one attribute, jnana, that, at one, that right now God has knowledge. Oh, but at one time he didn't. No. It is necessarily the case that if God has an attribute, that attribute is in itself non-distinct from God. They are a marker, lakshana, to use the Sanskrit. They are a marker of God, but they are non-distinct from God. In other words, you can know God by those markers, but at the same time, unlike with us, they are non-distinct. Now, let me go a little bit deeper into what I mean by this philosophically. Every one of us has attributes. We have non-essential and essential attributes. Let's just deal with the non-essential ones. Each of us have different hairstyles. They are lakshana. They are markers. They are ways in which, if somebody wanted to recognize us in a crowd, they could use our hairstyle. Probably my hairstyle especially. <laughs> if someone wanted to see, oh, where is a in this in this crowd? Well, look for the guy with long hair, with long dark hair. So these are markers. But this is the thing. While this is a non-essential attribute, it is not an essential attribute. These are not attributes which mark me eternally as who I am. I can shave my head, not have hair. So it's a non-essential attribute. 
God does not have non-essential attributes. By definition, if we understand what is the nature of God, we also understand that God being a being who transcends causality, temporality, and space, God being a being who is eternal, God being a being who is purely of the, let's say, mode of consciousness. Anything connected to God necessarily is connected to God eternally, as not merely a marker of God, but can be used as a marker of God. Thus, any attribute that God has necessarily is non-distinct from God. Again, we have markers. God technically does not have lakshana. He doesn't have things by which we can mark that, oh, this is God, but he has attributes that we can use as markers. In this way, God is different from us. This is going very, very deep. And I half apologize for that. And I half do not. Because again, this is what we're talking about. We want to understand God. You know, try to understand, try to understand brain surgery. You're going to be boggled. You're going to be amazed at how complex. That's nothing compared to understanding the nature of the divine. This is the nature of God and God's relationship with his own attributes. So this is what is being said here in this very last clause of this very last sentence. But now let's go actually up a little bit. All of these, again, all of these virtues, 38 in total, that are mentioned here, but then the Sanskrit itself makes it, makes it very clear, as well as many other virtues that are desired by those who are worthy of greatness. Now, who are these individuals? Mahatvam, Mahatvam is the Sanskrit. Who are these individuals who are worthy of greatness? In other words, those individuals who want to become sages, those individuals who want to fully embrace truth, who want to know truth, such individuals desire also these qualities and are eligible to have these qualities and more should cultivate these qualities within them. So this is important. With these qualities very specifically, these are qualities of God. These are virtues of God that God has, but more, we are also meant to have these virtues. So over the course of the next several classes that we go through this list, this is crucial to keep in mind that God is being spoken of here. These are qualities that God has, and again, specifically in avatar form, but more each one of us is also meant to cultivate all of these virtues in our own life. Now, virtues. Virtues. I haven't really spoken about this in a very long time uh, in an actual talk, but in our book, Sanatana Dharma, The Eternal Natural Way, I go very in-depth into this, about how the ethical system of Dharma, of Vedic spirituality, Buddhism, pre-Christian European paganism, Zoroastrianism, etc., etc., etc. In other words, the non-Abrahamic traditions. Their ethical system, our ethical system, is what is called virtue ethics. It's based on the idea not merely of a recompensatory sort of law system, but rather on the idea that how do we become good beings? It's not merely by following certain laws of morality. Yes, we do that too. But primarily, it is by cultivating virtue within us. In other words, the idea is that our Atman, our soul, who and what we truly are, is already good, is already perfect. The only reason why we are not acting upon that perfection is due to illusion. Because psychologically, we have fragmented ourselves, and we're acting as if we're something other than consciousness. But then when we embrace who and what we are as consciousness, then the natural virtues of Atman, of consciousness that are there, begin to come to the fore. And we begin to act not as illusioned beings who see ourselves at odds with other living beings and thus try to harm them and exploit them, thus acting unethically. Rather, we begin to see ourselves as what we truly are, 
consciousness part and parcel of the divine and we begin to see other living beings in the same way. You see, if we understand ourselves, and not just theoretically, again, experientially, as pure consciousness and more, we begin to see other human beings, and then how's this? Other living beings, animals, plants, etc., also as consciousness. How can we wish to harm them? It's not possible. When we truly understand who and what we are and what other beings are, when we begin to truly see, then at that point, the ability to act unethically is not even there. Because now we're acting in accordance with the natural virtue of self, of true self, of soul. And in this way, those virtues come to the fore. Thus, when you meet a person who has fully completed the spiritual process, what are you meeting? In vision, historically, who are you meeting? You're meeting a Jesus Christ. You're meeting a Buddha. You're meeting a St. Francis of Assisi. You're meeting a person who, when you meet this person and you encounter them, what you're encountering is love personified in person form. That is our goal, is to become like this. Because this is our natural state. So, this is why we believe in virtue ethics. That's why virtue, as opposed to merely morality, is stressed. What is morality? Something that's imposed from above, from without. It's the idea of law. The idea of virtue, well, and let me back up. This is the idea of law. Oh, let me not kill this person because, oh, it's, uh, there's a commandment against it. This is virtue. I would never want to kill that person to begin with. That's virtue. See the difference between law versus virtue. Law tells you don't kill that person, and you don't want to break the law, so oh, all right, I guess I won't. Virtue is, it would never even arise in me the desire to even harm that person. You don't need to tell me not to kill anyone. I never would. So, of the two, which is closer to one's heart? Which is closer to one's soul? To virtue. Thus, why am I telling everyone all this, giving people this little background in ethics? As we go through this list, now we understand. These are virtues that we are meant to cultivate. These are not laws. This is not, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Oh, don't see this list as something oppressive. Oh, on the contrary. You're gonna, what you're going to see are exactly virtues, behaviors, that we can cultivate in ourselves, in which, and with which, in many cases, we already have these virtues. If we didn't have at least some of these virtues, to at least some degree, we would not be sitting in this room right now. So, let us cultivate these maximally. Maximally. People, again, who know really nothing about spirituality but like to talk anyway will sometimes talk about how, oh yes, you know, uh, we need to have a balance in our life between good and evil, between light and dark, and oh, it's not, too, it's not good to go too far into being too good to anything that is auspicious. That is an individual who, unfortunately, does not understand the nature of duality and non-duality, the transcendence of duality. Something that is good, truly good, again, in the virtue sense, you cannot have enough of. Oh, I have tremendous love of God, but oh, now it's a little bit too much. Oh, it's starting to hurt. <laughs> That's a person who doesn't understand love, or God, or hurt. There are some things which, if they are of absolute value, the truth of the matter is, you will, and you will desire to, explore that virtue to an infinite degree for all of eternity. And at that point, even, you feel as if you've barely even tasted what is actually there. That is what it means to truly explore that which is absolute good.